my family, most of my family, enjoys word humor. And so one of the things that we've discovered recently are, um, is it homonyms or homophones? The, the, okay, the, the words that, it's like it's one word, but it can have different definitions to it, okay? So for instance, one of my favorite ones that I've uh, shared before is the word trunk. Now you can think of that in different ways, but if I say that the elephant used his trunk to put my trunk in the trunk, you know that that was actually, the word trunk was used three different ways in that sentence. All right, and so we enjoy kind of throwing around that word play. What was it? How many definitions do the word set have? 50 different definitions for just the word set, S-E-T. All right, you know, can you have a set of silverware? You can set something down. You can set a bone, you know, by putting it back in place. Those are just three off the top of my head. But it's got more definitions than any other word in the English language. Now, today in our passage, which is going to be Hebrews chapter 12, you can begin turning there. In Hebrews 12, we're going to see a word that is used twice uh, very close together, but has two different meanings to it um, based, on, based on how it's used in our English translation. So in Hebrews chapter 12, now Hebrews, we need to understand, is written to a uh, group of people, Hebrew Christians. So these are people who are followers of Jesus, but they have come out of a Jewish background. And they have been um, tempted to go back to the old Jewish ways and keeping the Jewish laws and traditions as a means of you know, pleasing God and, and being righteous. And so the author of Hebrews, some people say it's Paul, some people say it's somebody else. We don't really know. We're not told who it is. But the author is challenging them about the superiority of Jesus. He is superior to all those other things, according to the law, the sacrifices, the priesthood, angels, all those things from the Jewish um, background and from what we would call the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus is superior to all of these, and you need to depend uh, solely on him. And he's going to give us um, some instructions here, and I'm just going to read to you the, the four verses that are our text for this morning, then we will go back and explore them a little bit more deeply, okay? So Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 14. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled." that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. These are some instructions that are given to these Jewish Christians saying, here is how you live a life that is pleasing to God. And we're going to start by looking at two things that we need to pursue. Now, this word pursue is an action word. Um, if you have to chase after something, okay, your dog gets loose, you've got to chase after it. If you are you know, pursuing a particular goal, you know, if uh, you know, in a race, you know, the runner's running for the goal line, you are in pursuit of something. It is very much an active word. And there's two things that we are told here um, to pursue. The first one is peace. Pursue peace. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, he actually talks about this. He says in verse 10, For the one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Now, peace is something that is elusive to us sometimes. Now, we can talk about the peace that we're lacking in our own hearts, but I believe that this peace here is talking about peace between people. Seek after that kind of peace. Now, it can be hard like in Romans 12, okay, verse 18, it says, let's see if we can get to it here quickly, maybe not so quickly. Romans 12, 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. There are times when peace is not possible, but if it is up to you, be at peace. You might try and be at peace with somebody else and they will just have none of it. But he's saying, as much as it is possible, depending on you, do everything you can to be at peace with others. We need to be seeking after that peace, and we also have to be diligent, this is Ephesians chapter 4, to um, pursue peace, and the, maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So even peace is something that can be hard to get, but once you get it, you still have to work to maintain it. Because all of us are sinful people. We offend each other, we step on each other's toes, we're selfish, and because of that, those things can break the peace. So be diligent to maintain the peace. So whether you have it or you don't, it still takes work to be at peace uh, with each other. 
So I'm going to give you three practical ways that you can maintain um, peace or three ways to live in peace with each other. The first is to remember, and this comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 and uh, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has also forgiven you. We need to remember the forgiveness that we have been given. That's the best way to remember to be able to give it to someone else, is to remember, I have been forgiven. If you remember the parable, and we're not going to turn to it, but of the unmerciful servant, the one who has forgiven this millions and millions of dollars worth of debt, and he goes out from the king rejoicing in the, the, what he has been given, and then he finds somebody who owes him a few dollars, and he begins to choke him and say, pay me back, pay me back. And the king calls him in and is like, this is not right. You can't do this. I have forgiven you so much, you also in turn need to forgive others. Which is what Jesus tells us when he tells us to release others from debt. In Matthew chapter 18, Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, which the law required three times, or the tradition did. And he, and he said, well, seven times? And Jesus says, no. I, t I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven that you need to forgive. There should not be any limit to the number of times that you will forgive someone. Now, forgiveness, we think of as, okay, somebody wronged me, but forgiveness can also be looked at in like in a financial term. You owe me. You did something wrong, and so you owe me. You owe me an apology. You owe me restitution. You owe me. It's a debt. And he's saying, release people from their debt. They do not owe you. You, are, you should not hold on to that debt because you have been forgiven so much more. There is nothing that someone can do to you that is worse than what you have done to God. You killed his son. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so any other thing that has ever been done to us cannot compare. As horrific as it might have been or as frequent as it might have been, nothing is as bad as the debt that we owe to God. And God forgave that in Christ Jesus. And so we also need to release others from their debts. And then the last is that we also need to reach out. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is giving some instructions, uh, and he says in uh, 5 verse 23, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, okay, if you are worshiping, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go First be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. There is this command that if, there, if you remember, man, I've got this issue with somebody else. They're upset with me. I need to be the one to go. I need to be the one to reach out to make that step to make it right. If there is a lack of peace between me and somebody else, even if it's their fault, I need to be the one to go. The responsibility is on me. And so those three things are good ways to remember to keep the peace, to remember how much you've been forgiven, to release others from their debt. And if you understand that somebody else sees that you were indebted to them, go. Go and be reconciled uh, to them. So that's one thing that we need to be pursuing, is pursuing peace. But there's also something else we're told to pursue, and that is sanctification. And that's a big old word. Sanctification is, uh, some of your translations will say holiness. If you sanctify something, you set it apart for a special purpose. Kind of like some of you have your normal dishes and then you have your fine china that you bring out on holidays, okay? That is sanctified. It's set apart. There's some of you that are, you know, none of us I think here have ties today, okay? But if you think of your, your nice Sunday clothes and then you've got your everyday clothes, right? It's set aside for a different purpose. We are supposed to pursue sanctification, a holiness, a separateness from the normal for the purpose of of worshiping God. Sanctification. Now, it says sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. This word see is the word that I was referring to that is one of those homonyms where it can be used in different ways. Like right now, you see me and I see you. But that word see can mean something else. And in this case, it actually does here. This is not the a sanctification without which we won't see God face to face. We won't see him with our eyes. We know that one day when we go and we are in, in glory, we will see him. 
That's a, that's a promise that we have in Scripture. This word see means to perceive with knowledge or understanding. So if I am, um, okay, in my daughter's Spanish class, and the teacher, you know, in, in this language, I'm like, oh, man, what was that? And then Elizabeth leans over, this is what she actually meant. I'm like, oh, I see. If I explain a concept to you, okay, let's say it's some sort of like chemistry or math concept, and you're like, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. And then I explain it to you, oh, I see what you're saying. That's what this C means. It is a perception. It is an understanding. Maybe even a better analogy is if you were to introduce me and say, hey, I want you to meet my cousin. Man, this guy is great. He's so friendly. He's a lot of fun to be around. And I'm like, okay. And then I actually meet the guy, and we interact, and we spend the afternoon together, and I come away, man. That was one of the most refreshing times I've had. I see what you're saying. I see who this person is now that I have experienced them. That's what this word see here means. Sanctification without which you will not see or perceive with understanding who the Lord is. If you are not setting yourself apart as holy unto God, you will not know him as well as if you actually seek to pursue obedience to him and sanctification. All right? Now, I want to um, give you a verse that this one just really lit up for me my understanding of this concept. John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, and uh, verse 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, these are believers, they had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I want to be free. I want to know the truth. What's the prerequisite? If you continue in my teaching, if you follow what I say, if you are obeying me, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Sometimes obedience precedes understanding. Now, those of you who have raised children, you understand this, that sometimes, why do you need to do it? Because I said so. Because you were the one in charge, I need to recognize that, but I don't get it, I don't understand why, right? Do it, and you'll understand later. Obey first, and the understanding will follow. If you want to know God better, start obeying him more. Start setting yourself aside for his holy purposes and saying, I am going to follow you. Now, sanctification, like I said, it can also be translated holiness, and we also put with this the concept of righteousness. Now, I want to explain um, a difference here, because a couple weeks ago, we talked about how you are not guilty. When you stand before God, you do not stand before him guilty if you have already placed your faith in Jesus Christ. He has forgiven you of his, your sin, and so you stand before him not guilty. Okay, so you are righteous in his sight. That's one kind of righteousness. That is what's called positional righteousness. In a position before the law, you are righteous. There's something else which this passage is dealing with. That is practical righteousness. Practical is righteousness that you practice something that you do. And that's what the, today's passage is talking about. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, if I can get to it here, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours uh, in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. God has made us holy. He has made us to be like him. So start to act like it. Start to live like it. He has made you, so that's what you need to start being. He has positioned you as righteousness, so you need to start practicing that righteousness and live it out. Now, Hebrews chapter 10. This is a fantastic verse and one that I would encourage you to memorize. Okay, not the first verse I'm going to read, but the second one. Hebrews 10, 10. By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You have been, over and done with, you are sanctified. You have been positionally made holy and righteous. Now, verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified or are being sanctified. 
I like the way the NIV renders it. I didn't put it up here on the screens. By one sacrifice, he has made um, perfect forever those who are being made holy. He has made you perfect, and he is now making you perfect. He has positioned you as righteous, and now he is helping you to be righteous. I put it another way. You're holy, so start to live like it. Live it out. Walk out the new identity that he has for you. Now, those are the things that we are supposed to pursue. Pursue peace with one another and pursue a separateness and a holiness, a separateness from the world, a holiness to be like God. And without that, you are not going to understand God the way that you could. If you want to know God better, start obeying him even more. God, I want to pursue you more. I want to get to know you more. Well, how's your obedience? How, how's it, how are you doing in that regard? Now, that was the first thing, the things we are supposed to pursue. Now, we're going to go on to the verse that has the second C in it, okay? Verse 14 starts, um, or excuse me, 16 starts, 15, verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it. This C right here is a different word. Okay, see to it is how we would say it in our, our language here. But there's an, another verse that will give you a better idea of what this means. If we flip over to 1 Peter, and this time chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. We'll stop right there. That word, exercising oversight, is the same word that is see to it in our Hebrews passage. The responsibility of elders to look out over God's flock and care for them. What does it mean to provide oversight? Well, as a shepherd, I am looking for the care of the flock, the feeding of the flock, the leading of the flock, the protecting of the flock. It's just like a person looking over their family. You're responsible for all the care exercise oversight. Now, this responsibility is given to elders in 1 Peter chapter 5, but in Hebrews 12, that's not addressed to elders. That's addressed to the whole, whole people of God. Exercise oversight. See to it. And then he gives us three things that we are supposed to watch out for, that we're supposed to be attentive towards, okay? The first one, watch carefully for shortfalls. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Now, what does it mean to come up short, all right? If you were to reach for something, I can't quite reach, I'm coming up short. If I try to achieve something, I can come up short. In the kitchen, I've had a few things that I can say have come up short. Cabbage rolls, okay? I mean, if you guys remember, okay, look at my family there. They know there's a few dishes that they will go back to. It's like, well, at least this isn't as bad as that that we've had in the past. I've come up short. It's possible that we can come short of the grace of God. Now, what does that mean, coming short? Well, it could mean a couple of different things, and both of them are biblically accurate, so I'm just going to kind of lump them both together here. The first is seen in Galatians 5, verse 4. In Galatians 5, 4. Uh, excuse me. It takes a little while to turn to it. I know you guys have it on the screens. All right. Uh, you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Okay, God has given you his grace, but then what you're doing is you're trying to maintain your righteousness, you're trying to achieve um, approval from God through keeping the law. God saved you by grace, and now you're trying to live without grace. You're falling short of it. You're not utilizing grace the way that it needs to be. So basically, you're receiving partial grace. Okay? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Am I a wretched sinner? Was there anything I was able to do to rescue myself? No. All I did is said, I'm helpless. Help me. That's how God saved you. But these Jewish folks, and we can do the same thing, are saying, well, God, you saved me by your grace, but now I've got to run on the treadmill here to try and do enough good deeds in order to make you like me, in order to make sure that I stay saved, in order to make sure that I'm, I'm good enough in your sight. We're receiving partial grace that way. Instead of saying, I'm receiving all your grace, God, 
that means not just enough grace to save me, but enough grace to keep me and enough grace to make me acceptable in your sight. Do you understand the difference? So I lived under a, 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 uh, a weight of legalism for a while. Now when I say that, I, I knew that God loved me and accepted me. I did not know that God approved of me. And you understand the difference there. Like, yeah, you're part of the family, but you're really messed up. Like basically, eh, I don't like you so much right now. Okay, this was the perception that I had because I'd fallen into the same sin again. I hadn't done enough good stuff. And so I was not, instead of walking around like this, looking up at my father, glad to be in the family, I'm hanging my head like this, like I screwed up again, didn't I? You know, and it's like, God doesn't really, you know, love me. As a matter of fact, I had this feeling like I couldn't come to God in prayer because of the fact I had messed up so much and so I've got to be good enough for long enough in order to go back to God. How messed up is that? But that's where I was at. That's the way I was thinking about it. It's like, I committed the same sin again. Okay, well, I've got to go at least a day without committing it, then I can go to God in prayer. Okay? I was living in a partial grace. Does that make sense? I, I was falling short of the grace of God because His grace was enough to save me and embrace me and enable me to overcome those things come back to God and say, God, I'm going to quit trying to make myself acceptable in your sight. I'm going to accept the fact that God has already made me acceptable. He has already made me approvable in your sight. Okay? I don't know if I'm explaining this adequately. I've been there, and I'm guessing some of you have been too, where you feel that weight of the fact that you're trying to do it in order to earn God's approval rather than out of gratitude for God's approval. The fact that Jesus already made us acceptable. So that's one possible way of falling short of the grace of God. The other, though, is not just receiving a partial grace, but also giving a partial grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What does it mean to do something in vain? It means without effect. Okay, I can try to do something, but I'm going to do it in vain. It doesn't, it doesn't work well, okay? Um, I could have tried to fix my sewer pipe leak this last week, okay? I was afraid that I was going to do that in vain, and so I ended up paying a plumber to do it for me, right? Because I did not trust my own ability. I could try and try and try, but all those trips to Lowe's, all that money, all that mess, all that time, I was afraid it was still going to leak when I got done. I'm like, it's not worth it. I'm paying somebody else. I don't want to do this in vain. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. If we do, what that means is that we are not extending that grace to others. God, you have saved me, but I'm not going to extend that same kindness and love and grace to others. That would be also to receive God's grace in vain, to fall short of his grace. Like the person I told you about earlier who you know, he was forgiven this huge debt, and then he went out, and he demanded payment for somebody else because they owed him a few dollars, even though he had been forgiven millions of dollars. He received God's grace in vain. He was falling short of it. If you refuse to extend to others the grace that God has shown you, you're falling short of God's grace. Now, that doesn't mean it's not redeemable. What it's saying is like, okay, God, I'm going to get back on track. I'm going to extend to others the same love and forgiveness and patience that you have shown me in your grace to me. So we don't receive it in vain. We extend it. We don't want to fall short of God's grace. Now that's the first of the three things that we are supposed to be watchful for, okay? And when I think of this falling short of God's grace, we need to be looking up. God, this is what you've done for me, not just looking horizontally. Now this next one is going to get us looking down, all right? to make sure that there is no bitter root or root of bitterness, depending on your translation. This is um, back in Hebrews chapter 12, and we're in uh, verse 15. No root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. In our yard, uh, well, a few years ago, we didn't have a lot of trees in our yard, and then you know how the DNR every year will give away some free trees, and you can go, and they'll give you like three or four, and you can say, well, I want this kind or this kind, and they've got a selection out there. And I thought, we're going to get red buds. Those things really produce these beautiful sort of purplish pink blossoms, absolutely gorgeous trees for a week or two. But I got to tell you, 
If you put those things in your yard, you are making a commitment because they do not want to leave. Yeah, they, they, will, they put their roots down very, very deep and they are very, very tenacious. Now, the, um, I've, I've seen them like sprouting up and I can grab them. If you get it when the first leaf or two is there, you can pull and hopefully you can get that root out of the ground. If you wait, you will not get it out unless you're going to do some excavation because those roots go down incredibly deep. So that root springs up and it, it stays put. We need to be watching out for the root of bitterness among us. Now, when I first, I chose this passage because I thought, hey, this is great. We need to like, you know, we need to understand this. If there is any bitterness in my life, in my heart, in our, our church family, we got to deal with this, right? Okay, so that's why I was thinking this. And it talked about bitterness, like that, that this, it's a sin. We're not supposed to be bitter towards one another, you know, harboring anger or unforgiveness, you know, those kind of things. And if something like that takes root and springs up, it is going to spill over. A person who is angry and unforgiving, it, it, it's kind of visible and you see it and it, and it can spread and it can infect other people. That's what I thought this meant. It certainly applies and it's certainly true with any sin that we need to pull that root out and make sure that it doesn't, doesn't stay. But this root of bitterness is actually more broad than that. This is not just about bitterness. And I learned that um, from some commentaries that pointed me back to Deuteronomy 29. In Deuteronomy 29, this is God talking to the people about how they're not to have idols. And then it says, so that there will not be among you a man or a woman, a family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord your God, our God, to go and serve the gods of those nations, so that there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. All right? I, this is where this comes from, this whole idea of bitter root. A root coming up, bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. Interestingly, I think the word Chernobyl actually is translated wormwood, ironically. You got Chernobyl's been in the news, the contamination over there from the nuclear accident back in the 80s, right? Okay? This is not a bitter root. This is a root bearing bitter fruit. And so a root of bitterness in the, in the original context there is about idolatry, a sin that Israel struggled with over and over again through its existence. They would consistently turn to other gods, and if that idolatry was tolerated in one place, it spread to others. It's one of the reasons why they were not allowed to marry foreign uh, wives or uh, to bring in foreign husbands. It's like, if you're not going to be part of the people of God, if you're not going to assimilate in and become one of us and worship our God, you can't come in. Because what happens? You marry a foreign person, they bring in their worship of another God, and very soon, that person's heart goes after it. We see that with Solomon. We see it with plenty of other people. And when that starts to take root and grow, it drops fruit. Now, back to the redbud trees, all right? How many of you have redbud trees? You ever, okay. I feel for you because they look beautiful, but they are loaded with these seed pods that drop and spread all over. So we get them in our flower beds, popping up in our yard, along our fence row, in our bushes. These redbud trees come up. And so they are prolific in how they spread. And I've tried killing these things. I've tried chopping them down. I've tried chopping them down again. It's really hard to get rid of these things. And so once it is established, that root bears fruit and it spreads. And for us, it's infecting the whole lawn, trying to get, you know, with, with these redbud trees that, hey, a few of them is ni are nice, but I don't like the way that they spread and interfere with everything else. Got to get rid of them. All right. Now, to prevent bitter fruit, you need to remove the bitter root. To prevent the bitter fruit, you have to remove the bitter root. Now, whether it be a red bud tree or whether it be sin in our midst. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of references. We're not going to turn to them. But 1 Corinthians 5 and Revelation 2, both of them talk about the seriousness of sin among the people of God and how what you need to do is when that sin is there, you need to address it. And if a person will not repent of that sin after repeated attempts, that person, they're off the island. They are not to remain a part of the church because if you leave it, it will infect, it will spread. And so we need to be attentive 
okay? Be watchful, that term, that second C, C word that we were talking about. See to it, we need to be watching, first of all, ourselves, but then also the people of God. So like, you know, Kevin, if you see a sin in my life, you need to come and talk to me about it, not just kind of let it slide, okay? And same with each other. If you look around, this is our family here. And if we let that go and we don't deal with it, it is going to cause a problem. So, you know, if there's a sin in your life, Charity, okay, and, and Pat doesn't say anything about it, chances are it's not going to stay with you. It's going to spread to somebody else. You know, we're, it's going to go around. So watch yourselves, watch each other, see to it that no bitter root springs up, causes trouble. And what did it say? It defiles many. It's going to spread through the whole lawn. The whole organism is going to be infected by it, okay? Now, that's the second thing. The third is to make sure there are no immoral people. Immoral. Now, it says immoral or godless like Esau. Now, we don't know. The Old Testament actually doesn't talk about immorality. This is referring to sexual immorality here. Now, he did marry some foreign women. Okay, so maybe that's a reference to it. Or maybe it's using it more metaphorically, like in the Old Testament, idolatry and uh, other sins are referred to as spiritual adultery or fornication. So it's like he, God uses that relational term with him and talks about like we've been unfaithful in our marriage to him if we go and commit these other sins, okay? So we're not really sure exactly why he uses the term immoral, but it, the term godless, this one actually has to do with the idea of the threshold of a temple, okay? That it's, a, it's a word that references the threshold. You know, when you're going to go from one, like outside to inside, there's usually a board or a stone or something that marks entering in one place or another. And this word godless refers to a person who is barred from crossing the threshold into a temple because the person is irreligious. They're not pious. They're not holy. And so therefore, they cannot enter the temple to worship that God. And so it, he is referred to as a godless person a person that did not have that recognition of God and what he had given him. He wasn't reverencing God. Esau focused on his physical appetites. Now, if you go back to the book of Genesis, you'll see this, okay? That uh, Jacob and Esau, most of us are familiar with that story. I'll just recap it real quick. Two twin brothers, Esau was the oldest. In that culture, the oldest son got an extra portion of the uh, rights to the, his father's estate. So Esau would inherit two-thirds of his father's estate, and Jacob, as a younger brother, would have only gotten one-third. Okay, so that was called the birthright. Well, Jacob was um, making some food there in the camp, or in their, their area, household, and Esau had been out hunting, and he comes back in, and he says, oh, I'm so hungry. You know, give me some of that. Give me some of that red stuff. Okay, that stew that he was making. And Jacob's like, he sees an opportunity. Sell me your birthright first. I'll trade you this bowl of soup, but give me your birthright. Give me the rights of the firstborn. Let's swap spots. And Esau is like, sure, what good is that going to do me if I die of hunger? And so he traded two-thirds of the inheritance. Well, he would actually get one-third at that point, so it was really like one-third of the inheritance. He traded his spot as the firstborn son for a bowl of soup. That was a rotten exchange. Ever made a bad business deal, a bad investment? This was an awful, awful investment here. But that chapter in Genesis ends by saying, thus Esau despised his birthright. He was the one that should have inherited all of that. And along with that came the blessing that he would get from his father as the firstborn son. And in Hebrews 12 there, remember it said that even afterwards, okay, after he had sold it for a single meal, when he desired to inherit the blessing, okay, this is a separate thing that he got from his father, the blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. His brother ended up getting his blessing. He, he snuck in Jacob, he was being real sneaky. He deceived his father, who was old and blind, into giving him the blessing instead. But it was interesting. He, Esau sought after this with tears. He had given up his spot as the firstborn, but he still wanted the perks of it. He still wanted the blessing, even though he had forfeited it, made it for, traded it for cheap change. Now, in the context of Hebrews, what is, uh, what's the author saying here? Don't trade away the permanent for the temporary. Don't trade away the greater for the lesser. Don't surrender the blessings that God has for you, his inheritance rights, for this lesser thing. Hebrew Christians... Don't turn back to the law. Don't turn back to a graceless way of trying to earn God's approval. 
He has given you his acceptance and his grace. Hold on to that. Don't trade that away for the other way of doing it. It's a bad investment. It is a bad trade. And it says that he found no place for repentance. Now, there's a kind of debate exactly what that means. It could mean that he wanted to get out from underneath the consequences of his action, but he didn't necessarily want to repent from his action. That's one possibility. There's also the possibility that uh, this no place for repentance basically can be translated as no, uh, there's no appeal. You know how when there's a decision made in court and somebody appeals the decision, I want somebody else to take a look at this, see if we can change it around. It's possible that that's the meaning. But either way, he was stuck with his decision. He was stuck with it. And the book of Hebrews talks about that. If you are following God, if you are you know, a recipient of his grace and you walk away from that, that's a dangerous spot to be. Now, there is a possibility that a person, God calls to you and you can ignore him. And he calls to you again and you can ignore him. And he can call to you again over and over and you, you, you ignore him over and over and then it talks about how our hearts get hard. And there comes a point when our heart is so hard that we no longer even hear him. We just tune out the background noise. God, I'm not listening to you at all. If he is calling for you, he's calling you to repentance, he's calling you to surrender, he's calling you to him, don't harden your hearts. And I can't tell you, it's like, okay, well, seven times of doing that, or 70 times, or 700 times. You know, there's, there's no way for me to know, or for you to know, for that matter. How many times does God have to call and you reject him before your heart's so hard that you're not going to receive him anymore? If you hear his voice, it's time to turn. It's time to not be like Esau. Find that place of repentance. Go back to God and say, God, I want to come to you by grace alone, based on what Jesus has done. Don't let it get too long or too late. So as we prepare to have our closing song, I want to kind of walk through this again. Two things that you need to pursue, peace and holiness. And in the midst of pursuing those things, be watching out in our own lives, but also in the community of God to make sure that we don't have any of these things that could cause problems. Falling short of God's grace, not living in it, not receiving it or, or not living it out. Also, that we don't let any sort of bitter root of sin come up that's going to spread and cause a problem in our own lives or in God's community. And also, that there is not any person who is going to be godless, immoral, who is going to be wanting to have the perks of being a part of the family of God, but is not really a follower of God. That sort of thing needs to be addressed and say, this isn't what God has for you. Call that person back. Answer God's call in your own life to come back. So as we have this closing song, if God is speaking to you about any of these things here that we've uh, gone through this morning, I would encourage you, make a response to him. It could be a response of surrender. It could be a response of, to quit something. It could be a response to start something. But take it as a time of responding to him. And I'll be down front if anybody would like to pray. Uh, have somebody pray for you, pray with you. I'd be glad to do that as well.